The following is a conversation. It has the features of any conversation, such as imperfectly expressed thoughts, ill-considered opinions, and the notions of several sleep-deprived brains. Try not to get your stethoscope in a twist about it. Meandering in the margins of medicine, it's the Short Code Podcast. Weird news, fresh views, helpful clues, and interviews by students for students. Subscribe to our weekly show at theshortcode.com. Welcome back to the Short Code Podcast, a production of the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. We're here to give you an inside look at medical school from the students drinking from that fire hose. And I'm Dave Etler. With me today in the SB studio, she's a particularly robust mass of <laughs> mammalian cells. It's Riley B. And Bush. Hi. Famous for his many incredible nuclei, we've got M3 Rick Gardner. Greetings. His major histocompatibility complex is among the most effective at attaching to foreign substances. It's M4 Nathan Spitz. Was that a slut shame? For the- <laughs> 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 slut shame on the podcast? Hello, everybody. <laughs> And give a warm welcome to a man who successfully went from blastula to a fully developed animal, and he's only just getting started. Say <laughs> hello to M4 Zach Fleischacker. Hey, guys. A real beast. <laughs> An animal in the studio. I'm really also known as the powerhouse of the, of the cell. cell. Yeah. I haven't gotten a full mammal yet. Still animal. <laughs> How does that make you feel? Oh, multicellular, I'll take it. Yeah. <laughs> You're somewhere on the phylogenetic tree. <laughs> really good job on all your accomplishments. Any future cellular plans you'd like to you'd like to share? I bet he might metamorph some cells at okay. one point. I another. would like to necrose. <laughs> I'd like to move past the necrose. need for oxygen, like go anaerobic respiration all the way. Nice. I have a couple of goals myself. I'm gonna cut back on my phagocytosis <laughs> and form more tight junctions between the cells in my life that bring me joy. And I think for my own well being I should just keep the cells that I find difficult to deal with at sort of a gap junction length. Mm. Interview season, almost upon us. Riley, you've been doing some thinking about this, haven't you? Yeah, and for no good reason other than just the sadness that I feel that I am in no way moving on from the place that I'm at, which is fine. I love where I'm at. For those who are currently mentoring me, I'm very happy where I am. (laughs) But I'm sitting with a couple of friends that I had my first year, and they're preparing for interviews, and I am doing cell culture and having failed experiments. It's a very different world, so I'm super fascinated by what my cohort is currently going through. I think part of it I like to hear because it makes me feel better about the position that I'm currently in because you guys seem a little stressed. I am stressed Riley most of the time on this show and I am Other reasons. I can't wait for you to be a applying can you imagine it's gonna be i don't know if the show can go on at that time yeah but regardless i thought it'd be interesting to talk a little bit about what you guys are planning on applying for i'm assuming you know at this point because part of your application is due literally within hours at 5 p.m at 5 (laughs) p.m so yeah tell us a little bit about what you're going into and why Yeah, I can start. I'm applying into psychiatry. The super long life story short is that I was in like a three stoplight town. I lost my mom to cancer when I was a teenager. Also coming to grips with my identity as a gay person. Shoved everything down. It later exploded in like depression, anxiety, panic disorder, etc. This was kind of before mental health was like in vogue. Yeah, um, what, what, what age was this? So I was 13. Oh, that's a, um, that's a it's a fine, tough age. Correct. Fine yeah. Age, yeah. And this, yeah, you know, when nobody asked, you know, that, how you're doing. I never, like, talked about it with anybody. Didn't even know, like, what mental health was at that point. This was before, I think, on Instagram stories that people, like, oh, like, mental health awareness. And, like, I didn't know anybody who had any mental health conditions at the time. Then got on the medication and therapy train and realized, like, how big of an impact those can have on a person's life and, like, everybody else around them. I mean, through that... And that sparked a kind of interest in neuroscience and how the brain even works, you know, just kind of the profundity of like, what the F is going on up in this like sack of jello (laughs) and why is it making me feel so shitty? Anyway, like to kind of pair the biology and science behind that with the ability to really like connect with other people, I think is like 
people in medicine often talk about the the art or the blend of art and science and i feel like psychiatry like truly encapsulates that i could keep going on and, and on, you've but. thought this since day one so you're one of yeah. the rare people that i feel like came in kind of knowing what he wanted to do and really didn't waver that much would you say that's true that is true i think to my detriment but correct so i came into medical school specifically to apply into psychiatry going into i think now like looking back and i noticed this as i was going through i would in air quotes try and keep my mind open to what we were learning but i definitely like in looking back shut a lot of doors preemptively i think it made the experience a lot less enjoyable as i was for example like going through surgery rotations like f this like i'm never going to use any of this i'm never going to be in the or and i think i approached a lot of things with a negative attitude and so i would like recommend everybody who's coming into medical school or pay school or whatever field you do decide to pursue that you try and keep your mind open i mean i was caught off guard for example by like OBGYN, which is like a pretty far off from psychiatry but yeah i think it is like the statistics are less than what is it like half of people end up in like the specialty that they designate when they enter medical school so it's definitely more common to switch than it is to stick with it as well you know i i know aline on the show <clears throat> had a bit of advice recently that basically just not not just keep an open mind as far as your future specialty but but just keep an open mind about the experiences that you will have in those specialties and how they might be handy in the future and the fact that you'll never see that specialty again and mm -hmm. so you know it's a great idea to just experience it take it in be open to it and then you know move on if yeah because she was saying she's interested in psych as well or she's applying for psych i'm mm -hmm. pretty sure yeah, yeah, yeah. and she was saying that she would talk to her advisors and preceptors in these rotations and she was honest about what she was interested in going mm -hmm. into but she was also super willing to see everything mm -hmm. that she needed to see because ultimately psychiatry is gonna see patients that are right. probably going to every other, other doctor. specialty <laughs> and if you think about the mental toll that going through surgery takes and actually being able to understand surgery like i could see where that would be super beneficial mm -hmm. so. yeah like i'm in the icu right now for example and not loving it but they're <laughs> consulting psychiatry to do capacity assessments for which is just like for everybody like you don't have to consult psychiatry any physician can can assess a patient's decision making capacity but i mean it is interesting to like see the perspective of other providers and why they may be consulting you and whatnot so would agree try try if you can to take advantage while you can it'll make your experience that much more enjoyable yeah zach did you come in knowing i'm trying to remember no i was i'm going to be applying to otolaryngology ear nose and throat surgery and when i came into medical school i kind of had an inkling that i was probably wanting to do something in the or but i wasn't sure and i think i i eventually kind of narrowed it down to ent mainly because of just the insane amount of variety in the field. Like you've got, you know, patients of all ages from, you know, premature newborns to, you know, 90 year olds that you're operating on. You're doing the gamut of surgery from cancer operations to like really easy, like tubes and tonsils. And it's just something that kind of works with my personality. I don't have a, you know, a story like Nathan's where I was kind of like a, almost like a calling, which it seems, seems to be for, for Nathan. For me, it just kind of fits into who I am as a person as like, I'm, I'm always about trying to do new things and stay engaged. And Come on, uh, Zach, you told me that you were born without a head. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You little, you blastula. Yeah. That, uh, your head is actually not your own. It was a donated head. Uh, yeah, donor I, head. Just, I, I grew it. it uh, I was actually, I was actually the head and I took over this body. Oh, okay. That would make more sense, like, with the brain yeah. connecting everything. Yeah. But. So, but, you know, I think to speak to, to what we were discussing with how you go about choosing a specialty or if you have a specialty in mind, I think we all have preconceived notions of what a specialty is like from, you know, the media, you know, if you've... You have friends that have worked in the specialty or, you know, you know from whatever source you've heard, I think it's... You really have to experience it for yourself. You have to be in the clinics. You have to be, you know, in the floors taking care of the patients to really understand what that specialty does. And so I think going into every rotation with an open mind is always good. And then you can confidently make your decision like, yeah, I don't like this. Or, yeah, this is interesting. Like for me, a really big surprise was my first rotation was pediatrics. And I never expected to like pediatrics. And I really enjoyed it. I really enjoyed it. So. 
At what point did you finally decide? Because I've heard a lot of stories of people, you know, month before <laughs> applications are due or whenever it is that you kind of have to make that final decision that people are still like, I don't, it's between a few. And you said sure. you'd wanted to be in the OR. I mean, how'd you choose ultimately ENT? It's a great question. I think some specialties you can kind of make a decision the month before. Not a lot, but some. Uh, anything surgical, you're just buying a lot of stress for yourself. I kind of decided maybe about a year ago. So kind of a little bit past halfway through my core year, I had done my general surgery. I was like, I, I could do general surgery. I had done a few of the surgical subspecialties, including ENT. And I just decided that I was either going to do general surgery or ENT. And I did my advanced rotations and I and I picked the one that I liked the best. So I know there's a lot of people that, especially for the more competitive specialties, they'll dual apply if they feel like they really like two different things. They can see themselves in two different career paths. You know, one of them is, you know, more competitive than the other. They'll just dual apply and see see what happens. Talk uh, about stress. <laughs> yeah, it adds a little bit, but also it means like, you know, I I think for those people, sometimes it's a little less stressful because they know that, you know, if they really enjoy their less competitive specialty, like equally, they know that, you know, if it doesn't work out with the more competitive one, then they'll have a fallback that they're actually happy with. They don't have to go through re- reapplying or scrambling in the, in the match. So, well, you said you knew about a year ago, which means Rick. <laughs> What's good. Do you know? <laughs> I do. Yeah. What are you um, thinking? I am thinking gas, aka anesthesia. I don't AKA know. farts. <laughs> AKA flatulence. Uh, I guess that's what the hip people call it on Reddit. I don't know. I'm just trying to be hip. But yeah, no, I'm anesthesia. I was thinking internal medicine into cardiology, and then I did my anesthesia selective the two week here at uh, CCOM. And, and I, I found it like really interesting. I, I like the hands on nature of it. I, I just, for me, it was like, I love, I was a monitor tech before medical school, so I'd watch you know, 48 EKGs all at once and be monitoring them and calling the nurses or the providers if, you know, things happened. And I just like physiology. I find it really fascinating. And I just like, my thing is, I feel like I just want to be in the cath lab and I don't really care if I'm the person, you know, doing the catheterization. I just want to be in there. And so... I like how broad it can be from obstetrics into pediatrics to cardiac cases and even in the ICU, which Nathan seems he hates. And I think I'll like absolutely love. So, yeah. All right. Well, then it's a good time to talk about actually applying well, and everything well, before we do that can i circle yeah. back to two things that Zach mentioned? i think that are like worth mentioning one i want to say like and maybe this is not maybe just speak from a place of privilege but you don't have to have a story you can be just genuinely interested in the topic to pursue it and it is equally as valid now i think going through i Nobody wants, you know, like uh, things to happen to them. But I, it is an interesting thing to like toe the line of uh, like a phrase is like trauma porn, a feeling that you have to like sell yourself and like lay out these like deep, dark, you know, deep, dark secrets in one page in a personal statement. And I'm personally kind of struggling with how much because I think it is important to like a story and like what drew me to the field. But now I feel like I have almost no room to talk about why I actually enjoy the field so you everybody you have like a hundred percent control of how much you do choose to like disclose information like that that's just kind of like a personal i think that's an excellent point i I, because i think a lot of people do feel like like oh if i don't have a story to tell like why is anybody gonna think that i'm worthy Mm. i think a story is important or i i should say a a, a, like a a, a, a pivotal uh, change yeah. yes, like, a, like, a, like an important story like yeah. a yeah, like story a, with like a capital a S real yeah. purpose yeah. like a because I think my story is just like I've just had experiences just gradually nudge me and push me and just funnel me into what I think is best for me and far more common mm-hmm. yeah and I think just be true to like what your story is yeah, yeah. that's mm-hmm. mine and it seems like you know that's kind of the consensus of what happens as well although you know if you ever need to go through the match again take my story for you, Zach, of having no head and feel free. To- I was actually going to, I was really contemplating telling, telling the story of the time I was 14 years old on a transatlantic flight and I had to do mm. a cricothyrotomy with a pen. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, and ever, the, ever since then, then. the plane went down on an island and you were lost for many years. Yeah. There's a whole the TV only, show about the it. The only medical adjacent person <laughs> available. So Is there a doctor? You were like the doctor of the island. Yeah. <laughs> Student doctor. Doogie Hauser <laughs> Spread situation. coconut salve all over people. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so, you had a second oh, point. Though. Second thing, if something has happened to you, or like if you identify in a certain community, 
community, I think there's also some like pressure as people like start to apply to feel that pull to like come back to a specific community, whether you're a rural applicant or whether you are black or et cetera, to like do things like focused like within that field. And again, I think like medicine is a job at the end of the day. And if things like hit too close to home for you or too personal or too taxing or anything like that, I just kind of want to like let people know like it's okay. Like you don't have, it's hard. I don't want to say you, you don't, don't have, have to, to look feel. at it as a call. Uh, you don't have to look at it as a calling, I think is what you're saying. Correct. Like well, it's it, still a job at the end of yep, the day. Right. And in some regards, having some degree of space that from that mm-hmm. like almighty purpose of medicine. Yeah, I want someone to have that, but I think there's a balance between that and it's still a means to an end for you to live your life and make money and pursue other things that you have in the world. And honestly, I'm sure some people in medicine like feel strongly that it should be one way or the other. I think striking a balance between Mm -hmm. recognizing like have that purpose, but don't let it become your entire being Mm -hmm. because ultimately I, I just truly feel like that's not what most residency programs are looking for they want well-rounded humans they Mm -hmm. want people who are not going to become burnt out because they're seeking passion and passion only but at the same time like they want to see that story but it doesn't have to be crossing the seven seas to get there so amen yeah as there's you know just like last week you know a resident who died by suicide and i've been thinking a lot about the kind of like exploitative nature of medicine and of residency in general as we like enter this application season and i think exactly like you said like having some form of separation or space so that these programs have like less of a ledge to i think like exploit you and use you for the pawn like that is game. maybe what their game is so. correct so if it's less of a calling maybe you'll be more inclined to have that kind of self-preservation and willingness to like stand up for yourself as opposed to the oh it's a calling like <laughs> what do you mean you don't want to come in on your day off for another 24 hour shift yeah isn't this your calling isn't this your purpose anyway i think when there's a calling too we almost romanticize the idea that like let's be full committed and that's all there is like kind of you mentioned it's an all or none and that's this is like we mentioned it's this is a job mm-hmm. like this is a, and if you want to make it your all if you want to make this your sole purpose in life that's you're more than willing to do that but i don't think that should be the baseline Mm -hmm. correct and i think that's how we lead a burnout Mm -hmm. yeah i think this is a super awesome kind of segue and what we're going to talk about next which is the next point in your application is interviews and you're likely to have lots of them because i strongly believe in both of you and i think you both wonderful candidates but i think there's a lot of questions and yet another opportunity to kind of sell your story sell your purpose, talk about yourself. And there's a lot of interview questions that I think you can answer in a wide variety of ways. Hence why the number one advice is for applicants to do mock interviews. But at the same time, just kind of thinking about answers in the terms of your own brain can be a little bit confusing. So today we're going to talk a little bit through some of these questions you guys are for sure going to be asked and we will, uh, you'll be asked next year and I'll be asked in like 15 years (laughs) just about like, how do you go about answering these? Because we kind of, for example, the first one is tell me about yourself. I mean, and you kind of alluded to this a little bit. This is a really awesome opportunity to talk about that path the path you got there the way your calling came about as you guys have started to think about your answers to these which i'm assuming you've thought about a little at this point Mm -hmm. where do you see is like the key insights that you hope to talk about i've seen it kind of like broken down into they almost you know there's like recommendations of keep it between two to five minutes at length so i've seen it kind of like broken down i think well into like different like time portions like first like demographics to like what drew you to the field three like to put in some like positive attributes i think now as i like start to approach the season something i want to incorporate more is the kind of things that can't be gleaned from an application so including things like hobbies and your life like outside of medicine that can give interview a wider view of who you are as a person because you're applying for this job to be like a colleague not just a cog in the machine when they hopefully like want somebody who's engaging and has interest in life 
experiences and things that they can, can connect with outside of the job. So as I approach like the interview season, I think I'm looking or will try to incorporate some of those aspects into the tell me about yourself because it is it's vague for you to like open up however you will. I feel like it also can invite them to ask down the road like, OK, so you told me about yourself, maybe why this specialty and then you can give like a more flushed out answer in like subsequent questions as well whereas they might not explicitly ask for like hobby and they might and they may have that information but that's kind of my take on it i kind of strongly believe that an interview to make a good impact on somebody it's not almost it's not really that much about your actual content that you tell them it's about how they feel about you it's about like oh yeah i like i like that guy mm-hmm. general it's, it's, generally, a vibe it's a vibe check interviews are vibe checks uh-huh. you heard it um, here first you know like you know, all, you know, all the applicants are going to have, you know, wonderful accomplishments, fantastic stories, and they're all going to be great people. And really to stand out as an, as an interviewee, it's just about how well you connect with your interviewer. And so to that extent, like you're right, you don't want to go on like long monologues about, about your life, about, you know, why you love this specialty so much, why about it's the great, it's the greatest specialty in the universe, et cetera, et cetera, because, you know, you're not actually interacting with the interviewer at that point. So, you know, you know, my thoughts are, it's like kind of like how you were talking about Nathan about like, if you get asked a question, like, tell me about yourself. You really kind of want to craft a pretty short response, less than two minutes, that invites further questions. So, like, give them, like, the highlights that actually make them interested in who you are as a person, and then they'll ask you about it, and then you can get that interaction, and they'll get the vibes. So, it's like, you know, you start with, okay, I was born here, maybe, you know, a little bit about your family, about where you grew up, where you went to school... These are some things I really like to do when I was in medical school. You know, you don't have to tell them why you want to go into that specialty. If they want to, mm-hmm. if they if they want to know that information, they can ask you a separate question. Just like this is really important to me in medical school. This is what I did, and then you say like outside of medicine, I like to do this mm-hmm. and this and this and this. And I think kind of that approach is a really straightforward way to invite further conversation mm-hmm. and uh, establish the vibes. And yeah. something to draw into is pick out those things that are like truly unique to you. Those are the things that they're going to remember about you. Like it's the guy who, you know, does llama farm, you know what I mean? Like llama just, farming or like that's the thing that they're when they pull up your picture, so cool. when they decide the rank list, like they're going to blow up your picture and like they're going to call like, you llama boy. Yeah. yeah. Say it, llama yeah, boy llama goes boy. to number yeah, one. You're be <laughs> like, yeah, it's true. Yeah. So short. I just, yeah. uh, if, if you're not sure what makes you uni- unique. Definitely consult with the people mm-hmm. in your life because I know that this is a common problem when you're considering like a, like your personal statement or whatever. People are like, I don't know, I just I just I'm just me, you know. Like I've been been here mm-hmm. with me all my life. Who knows what makes me unique? It's kind of a hard conversation to, mm-hmm. or it's kind of a hard thing to discern about yourself. Right. Ask your friends. Ask your llamas. Yeah, <laughs> mamas. Llamas, they might not respond. Your llamas, mamas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Correct. I yeah. Think- I was going to say, I think an important point, like even beyond the substance, because I think we largely talk about the substance, but the delivery is also important. So I I think of like how we all introduced ourselves on the show. I mean, that that gives you a taste of who we are personality wise. If I would have just been like, hello, my name is Rick. Nice to meet you. Like there's, I'm talking with excitement, you know, the way you use pitch and you formulate, you know, Ooh, this the, is good. all the, the things that noise makes and such. I don't know. <laughs> Intonation. <laughs> Intonation. <laughs> Stuff like that. Go. Yeah. You know, I think that, you know, and even like cracking jokes. So I, I think, you know, I remember very specifically, Nathan, you're like, oh, I'm Nathan. I'm from the three stoplight town in Osage, Iowa. Like I, that in itself, that's, you could have just said I'm from Osage, but you threw in something else mm-hmm. and you made it characteristic to you and you're like, oh, that's kind of interesting and kind of how you mentioned zach that it opens up for questions and that's i think the important part as well so yeah if if interviews are really just a vibe check like you have to bring forth the vibe and you're gonna go in and you're gonna be nervous and i remember doing interviews for medical school and i just remember like my only goal was to just be the excited person that I am. A lot of people, if you know me in person, I'm a fast talker, fast walker. Like I'm just gonna, I'm a, a in some ways a bundle of energy, and you that's like what I would retrieve energy. energy. Damn it. And I want to bring that thunder. out. I mean, I know that there are so many people that might feel like, oh, this is a professional interview. Whether you're interviewing for medicine, a job, or a residency, you're you're feeling that pressure of, oh my god, I have to make a good impression. 
honestly, at the end of the day, they just want to see what your personality is like. Mm -hmm. And there's no point in me dampering my energy, my golden retrieverness. <laughs> when ultimately that's what I'm going to bring to their program is I'm going to be in some ways kind of a, an energetic person for them so mm -hmm. yeah definitely like not just what you say but how you say it show your excitement i just had one of my friends interviewed here actually and i he just was asking about interview advice and i'm like be true to yourself like yes you want to be tactful in your delivery of like what you're talking about but showcase who you are because the end all be all is you are going to be someone's peer you're going to be someone's mentee you're going to be someone's you know classmate or you know you know whatever the term might be or the connection might be you don't want to just be someone who is just a student because as we kind of mentioned earlier you know that it's beyond that i want someone who i'm going to enjoy being around who's going to elevate me to the next level both within this you know the academic environment but in life in and of itself so also a good point you're full of good points today. You said <laughs> you said I want somebody who's going to elevate me and I think that's what every program probably wants or every med school probably wants is you know somebody who's going to contribute in some way and everybody has something to contribute. So figure out what that is. And for residents it's RVUs baby. RVUs hey, I'm here to give you money. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I mean that is this I mean maybe we'll talk about this later but it's unfortunate i think as i've like talked to residents and fellows and junior uh, attendings that these pro i mean at the end of the day like we are employees for the and yes they want like a family and cohesion etc cetera, etc cetera, but like they want people who they know that they can depend on that will keep their department afloat yeah i think there's that's a i think we talked about all the points just try to make yourself unique reflect a ton as if you haven't already been in trying to put together your application but just more self-reflection try to think about kind of what's your journey why do you like what you do and speak with excitement but there's other questions as well that one's kind of fun but i think some of the hardest questions and in interviews i've done in the past are the ones where they're almost setting you up to fail by asking you for example what types of people do you have problems working with who do you not get along with? What are your weaknesses? And I don't want just the weakness where it's like, I'm too good at things. I am too productive. It's like, oh, back off. Uh -huh. Like, oh, you're too productive. Like, you're too, you have too much time management. Like, you know, the ones where you can flip it. Like, you should flip it. But right. how do you guys think that? <laughs> these sorts of questions should be answered i have no no clue in hell how yeah I'm let's talk about this that. first one because this i think this one's really interesting it's which type of people do you have problems working with and this is from a list of questions people mm -hmm. have gotten oh, yeah. in residency interviews yeah. and a key thing that residency programs are looking for is do you are you going to get along with the people we have in our program now and will bring into mm -hmm. our program later but at the same time and also, how do you problem solve it's a hard question to answer without dragging some other people there's that fine line between making sure you want to talk about the resolution you have with people that you don't like working with you don't want to drag the you don't want to just go in and be like oh i had this this guy chris he was the worst Douche. he just he just went and you go on and on and on <laughs> But at the same time, like you still have to answer the question right. honestly. You can't just like skirt, not answer the question like a lawyer might. <laughs> yeah. So what do you guys think? I think you hit the nail on the head is never to like a bad mouth or disparage uh -huh. or put down anybody and to always kind of approach it as a place of like you or at least I guess how I approach it is it's something about me. Like I haven't communicated well enough or I haven't asked enough questions or it's like on me. And then to use it as like a strength too of like, you know, I people that I have struggled to work with in the past, you know, you can give like exam. I think people like examples to show that you can like problem solve through it of whatever. There was some flaw in the communication. I, you know, notice as I'm a perceptive person, whatever, like notice that communication was off. I intentionally ask more questions to get more understanding from this person's perspective. And then because of that, we were able to like remedy that situa situation. And I think that ty type of answer of, it's like a me thing i had you know use intentionally addressed it here's what i learned from it can highlight your like critical appraisal of situations your like self-awareness and self-recognition and your ability like you said to like work with everybody and apply those within psychiatry i think it's interesting too they'll i've seen this question posted of like like what type of patients are most difficult or tell me a story about your most difficult patient or patient encounter and i think again it kind of 
the formula, so to speak, is not knowing enough information, showing your kind of inquisitive nature as to why this conflict is happening and what you do from there. But, Demonstrate uh, empathy for the other person, you know, like I think that's yeah. part of what you said. Mm -hmm. And maybe turn it around and maybe say, well, I, I like working with the kind of person who is so instead of saying i don't like working with x you could you could maybe a little bit more subtly turn it around and say i like i, I do like working with people who are very responsible and people who are you know diligent and you know all this kind of stuff mm -hmm. yeah i think also there might be a situation in which it's more so a self-reflection months down the line. I can imagine when you first start clinical rotations, the way you exude yourself on those rotations is probably going to be a little bit different than the way you do toward the end of the rotation. I rotations. don't want anybody exuding themselves. <laughs> keep your exit date to yourself. Keep your exit date away. But I think ultimately you can you probably grow a lot in that year and you look back and you recognize the relationships you had with residents at the beginning mm -hmm. is not the same way that you approach relationships toward the end so ultimately the key thing here is going to be self-reflection mm -hmm. and again if you are a person who finds yourself in the boat where you often put the blame on other people mm -hmm. and don't reflect on what you've done to make that relationship worse this is a really good opportunity mm -hmm. to look within mm -hmm. and not without like this is not a question about who do you hate this yeah. is a question about how do you personally deal with those people that you don't get along with mm -hmm. that well i think the big point there in addition to everything you just said is to acknowledge the fact that you have the grand opportunity to throw yourself under the bus willingly depending <laughs> on how you answer this yeah that's my mm -hmm. thought is you can you can be truthful and you can do your reflection but is if you don't either approach it correctly or with enough tact you can you can end that interview on the mo like that spot in that moment yeah i think another example too is of these kind of theme of questions that could reflect poorly on you is describe a time where you received an evaluation that you disagreed with what do you guys think about how to answer that one as well? You know, I think a lot of these are, you know, as, as a general point, they're, they're, they're questions that are, I think, poking at an individual's ability to, like, like you said, self-reflect. But I think it's also a good opportunity to show how you can grow as a person, especially if you can kind of flip it and say, your program will help me grow or you guys will help me develop into a better person, physician, surgeon, whatever it may be. I think it's a, a very easy way to to kind of make that question a less dangerous one. But to Rick's point, like don't go into a residency interview and say like, I hate working on a team. Mm -hmm. I'm really bad at it. Yeah. Or, but I'm going to work on it. I got it. this evaluation and I thought it was dumb. So I ignored it. You know, right. You don't want to send that. That's not the message. You like, yeah. And for, and for that kind of specific question where it's like, okay, you had someone evaluate you and provide you feedback that you didn't agree with. I think that's like the way you approach that is it's, you can't say, I think they were wrong or I End think of story. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, you know, you can kind of, you can dance around it. You can say like, I felt like I was having a bad day. We didn't have enough face to face time for them to get a, a true evaluation of, you know, who I am. I was you know, working from a position of, you know, I was at the beginning of the rotation. I wasn't really sure what's going on. But, you know, once again, those are kind of like opening you up to uh, it's almost like superficial excuses right, for, for why is, things yeah. for why things didn't go well. You could say something like, you know, this had not been consistent with my previous evaluations. It was a real shock to me to, to see this perspective. And, you know, while at first I, I disagreed with it, I was like, this had to be wrong. I can't believe someone actually thinks that th thinks, thinks that this about me. Really, it was a trigger for me to actually do a little bit of introspection and see how some people might interpret my behavior in this way and yeah. provide that feedback. I was going to say, that's good. You could say something along the lines of, my job as the person being evaluated is to take that information and do and decide what to do with it. Basically, take it in, make it a part of me, don't take it personally and try to figure out, you know, what I can how I can use that evaluation to make myself a better person. And so sometimes you get dinged. That's my opportunity to you know, figure out if I'm doing something truly wrong, if it was a bad day or what was going on 
that caused that person to f- feel that way about me. I also at the like in these type of questions, I would avoid or try and like pick very benign, if possible, benign evaluations and possibly use that as I'm going to like draw I got this person. evaluation. Yeah. I got this evaluation and it said, keep reading. And I <laughs> yeah. said, damn it. It is, it is not lying to choose one of your Correct. lesser like they're not saying what is the worst evaluation Correct. you ever got. It's what is an evaluation. I was going to add, Mister, be tactful in what your response is, and potentially you can like use the evaluation or the you know wrong evaluation to a strength. I'm going to like use my example on the surgery rotation where I got feedback that my notes were too long, which I like. You know, I did. It's not that I necessarily disagreed like i understand where the surgery department was coming from and like working towards efficiency but i think you also like could potentially spin that of like i want to pursue psychiatry i'm like really interested in like how people are doing how they're feeling like what they're thinking etc and like that is reflected in my notes and i although i understand the necessity to be efficient on general surgery rotations and to be respectful of people's time like my you know i think if you are before interviews think about questions like this and try and pick ones that can like highlight in addition to a growth mindset and a willingness to seek feedback i think you also can like find opportunities to use these as strengths as well yeah it can show yet again another example of maybe why that the specialty you've chosen was maybe a better fit for you Mm -hmm. than another specialty in your example it's i i want to spend more time and energy with each patient i see i wanted the ability to kind of elaborate on the i guess less surgical aspects of patients and i think that's really important and you can spin it the key will be to not do so much spinning that you don't answer the The question question. Mm -hmm. correct so find that happy medium between actually answering the question and it all kind of comes down to in interview skills making sure you're actually listening (laughs) to the question and you're not just thinking how am i going to spin this to make myself look best take a moment take a pause like actually think about these Mm -hmm. things both ahead of time and in the middle of the interview don't be afraid to ask for clarification or to ask them to repeat the question especially lengthy one oh I hate me a lengthy question. All of medical school. And I think this is too, like you said, to listen. I feel like oftentimes, especially in interviews that we're listening to respond, this happens like in conversation as well. And so like you said, taking that moment to pause, if you ask them to repeat themselves and you've also just potentially bought yourself an extra 10 seconds for you to formulate some form of response. Our sponsor this week is the professional and graduate school virtual conference from us at the University of Iowa Carver College of Medicine. Join us on Thursday, October 6th at 2 p.m. as we showcase careers in healthcare, education, and biomedical research. This exciting event is being hosted on Zoom, and we'll have breakout sessions to explore biomedical science, PhD, doctor of medicine, MD, and physician assistant, MPAS degree programs. Register at shortcode.com slash careers. Shortcodes, we love to hear from you, no matter what. It's about. So call us at 347 Short CT with questions, shower thoughts, complaints about your situation, whatever you like. We'll talk about it on the show. Well, those are pretty much the hard questions you're actually going to see. There's just generally the themes of people trying to like make you say something bad about yourself and you having to somehow twist it to something good about yourself. But they're not all going to be bad. And there's plenty of funny examples of questions that have been asked. But I think Dave has some kind of better examples. Well, let's get some practice. Yes. Today with an improv game. <clears throat> I'm calling this improv game. Good answer. Here's how this works. The three of you will be the interviewers, and one of you will be the interviewee. Interviewers, you'll choose questions from the question cup. And interviewees, you'll choose your answers from the answer cup. Interviewers, please act as you imagine an interviewer would act. For instance, rushed, skeptical, super friendly, overly friendly. (laughs) No Um, facial expressions. Interviewees, your job will be to respond to the questions using the answers you've selected. Okay. Go ahead, Riley. Ask your first interview question. So, Rick, thanks for telling me a little about yourself. I figured we'd jump right into the rest of the interview. Sound good with you? Sounds good. All right. So, can you tell me about a time when you disagreed with a colleague and how did you handle it? That's a really good question. I appreciate that. Shouting really can distract attention from a legitimate problem. 
And I found that getting yelled at by my colleague wasn't the best way to solve the problem. So I said, you know, I just listened to the concerns. And, uh, you know, after a little bit, I just was, you know, I just don't really feel like this is the best way for us to communicate. I understand that you're upset, but if you were to lower your tone or lower your voice just a little bit, I think we would be able to have a more productive conversation. And so we were, you know, they they were able to do that. We we just took a, you know, took a deep breath. We did that and I felt like I was able to resolve the issue rather easily and it ended up being just a minor thing that I had done and I just didn't realize it. Wow, that was I was that that was great. That was pretty good. <laughs> I just love that. the first word was shouting. And I was like, how the hell am I supposed to rescue this? A uh, valiant effort. Zach, do you have a question for our interview? Yeah, uh, Mr. Rick. So you, you think you you can be an anesthesiologist? So what is your approach to dealing with upset or aggressive patients? Thank you again for another good question. I, I do that thing where you hold a blanket up in front of yourself and then you run away while dropping it. <laughs> And I, I really think that's a <laughs> metaphor for how I choose to practice anesthesia. And for them, it's I know they're going to be upset. I, I try to comfort them. I provide empathy and I, you know, I reassure them that they're in good trained hands. And, you know, similar to the blanket, I have a surgical draping that is in the OR. And instead of running away, it's a push of propofol and a little bit of succinate. <laughs> a follow up question. Are you comparing patients to bulls? To bulls? Yeah. Yes. Can you spell that for me? <laughs> <laughs> bulls. <laughs> like a bull. B u l l s. Correct. Yeah. You know, I I I didn't think I was, but after much consideration, <laughs> I, I still don't think I am. That is an excellent point. Thank you. <laughs> yes. All right, Nathan. <clears throat> so we've spent hours talking about all of your failures. Now I'm wondering, could you tell us what some of your greatest accomplishments are? Yeah, yeah. I, no, I think that's I think it's go, you know good to balance the mm -hmm. the negatives and the positives and mm -hmm. vice versa. So I, some of my positives are I immediately validate theirs, whether it be yours <laughs> or the patient's lack of understanding or their theirs still yours or the patient's weird personal views, and you know. Quite frankly, I don't really know what I mean by that. <laughs> <laughs> I say, reading is not one of them. <laughs> but, you know, in a roundabout way, I like to think that we all have unique experiences, whether that be upbringings or quirky traits. And I think they all have a place. And I like to make... I, 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 I'm parentheses <laughs> catching my thoughts. Uh, Asterix panics. <laughs> <laughs> I find that it can be very helpful to be surrounded by people, and I like to embrace their uniqueness. Mm -hmm. Is that why you're pursuing anesthesia? <laughs> so you can appreciate patients? Yes. Uniqueness? You know, I, I found that. Um, when we when a, a subtle push of a little bit of valium can really bring out the inner weirdness that people have by lack of filter and i i, I really <laughs> like to embrace that and and truly immerse myself in that environment mm -hmm. of weirdness nice so you were gonna twist it and be like and that's why i think your program is best for me <laughs> you can see the level of panic by yeah. how much <laughs> i've twisted these like this was an easy question a little bit harder wow i did not know what was going on <laughs> all right let's have the interviewers this time be zach and riley so you have your three, Nathan. Nathan, tell me a little bit about how, how you collaborate with colleagues. Mm -hmm. You see, when I'm approaching collaboration with my colleagues, I first usually keep it bottled up inside. And I think this is really important for me and how I approach these difficult situations. I think it's really important to self-reflect on how I approach these situations, what my potential biases may be. And so by taking that time to bottle it up inside, maybe agitate it, shake it up a little bit, and to provide some energy to that situation. I think once I've had that time to marinate, it's a lot of food in here. A lot of, I went with like the Coke and Mentos. So chop things up, You're correct. mince a little bit. <laughs> yeah. Put it on the stove, turn it to like medium <laughs> high. Correct. That I can release that energy in a more appropriate and controlled fashion. Thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, I think the 
the idea of bottling it up is uh, is an important one to think about. But I think there's other challenges that physicians are facing today. So what would you say that those challenges are? Mm, well, it looks like some of those challenges are that I once made some brownies that were well reviewed. And I think this really hits to the point that we talked about earlier in our interview that one of the challenges in medicine that people may face is the separation of work life balance. I think right now in medicine there's a a push from, you know, trainees to try and have more of that work life balance so that they can pursue their hobbies. Mine is making brownies and it can be difficult to when you have such a fantastic bakery like myself that I run on the side to have to give up that part of myself while I'm at work, which is a big problem in medicine. But to work past that, I found that I can continue my hobbies like brownie making and I can share that with my colleagues so that I can still, although I want like a work-life balance, I think I can still bring joy to both like parts of my life and the families that I feed for free with my bakery, as well as my colleagues oh. in the workroom. Thank you for your answer. Wow. You're welcome. All right. Moving on to more meaningless platitudes. <laughs> <laughs> How do you approach discussing unpleasant topics with patients and their families? You know what? When I want to talk to families, my motto is that doing something is, is better than doing nothing. So whether it is, you know, a gentle stroke of the hand or just some mm-hmm's <laughs> to let patients know that that I'm that I'm listening I found that that doing something is is better than nothing sweet great job <laughs> you got the Thank job you. well well done I would hire everybody in this room both for their interviewing skills and for their interviewee skills Aww. interviewer and interviewing skills thank you so much Shortcoats, if you're enjoying our conversation today, I'd be grateful if you'd let people know by posting a story on Instagram or Facebook or tweeting about us. And don't forget to tag us in your post. Yeah. Thank you. You guys, Shortcoat listener Emily left us a message at 347 Short CT because she knows we love to answer listener questions. She is thinking about a particular specialty, but she has some reservations. Let's hear from Emily. Hey there, short coast. I'm Emily. I'm in a gap year and applying this cycle. My mom is a family medicine doctor who has primarily worked as a hospitalist. I'm also leaning towards family med or internal medicine, so I know that a lot of people change their minds once they actually get into medical school, so I'm keeping an open mind. My mom brought up a little while ago that maybe family med wasn't great to go into because if you want to specialize later, you can't. Once you go family med, it's kind of a dead end. Can you guys discuss why family med doctors can't go into some of the IM fellowships that aren't really filled up every year, like infectious disease? I know that FM docs probably shouldn't do cardiology or something like really intensely like specific like that, but are we really saying that a doctor with more pediatric and obstetric experience wouldn't be valuable in some of those roles? Making family med less of a dead end might also help with our shortage of primary doctors. Do you guys see this changing anytime soon? Thanks. Thanks, Emily, for writing in or for calling in or whatever you did. What a good question. Yeah. You know, I think it... Is family medicine a dead end? Aren't they all kind of dead ends? Like, <laughs> I mean, compared to like what PAs like can life. do where they can jump between specialties, like in some degree, the specialty mm -hmm. you choose is always going to be a niche that you end up in and that you can only move so much within. Mm -hmm. Right. But I think the core of her question is, is why is someone who's trained three years in internal medicine versus someone who's trained three years in family medicine, why one is not qualified for certain fellowships versus the other? You know, I think as far as just speaking on the residencies themselves, I'm not sure if any of us are super knowledgeable about the exact curricula of the or the differences between those two. But, you know, it's my understanding and my experience that family med has has a lot more outpatient clinic and it's kind of focused on a more i guess holistic non-hospital problem based type of medicine so you're kind of managing chronic diseases in the chronic setting versus in internal medicine where you're mostly you know treating people who are in the hospital who may have 
chronic diseases that need to be managed, but for whatever reason, they have acute flares of those diseases, or there's another reason that they're hospitalized. I, I, I don't think I have the expertise to, to comment on why someone who's been trained in family med wouldn't be able to spend three years more and be a qualified infectious disease doctor, but I think that's kind of the differences there. And, and I think there are... are to hit on Zach's point, just to like reiterate that it's a, probably a lack of exposure for certain fellowships, like cardiology, for hematology, oncology, etc. But there are still several fellowships that both family medicine and internal medicine doctors can apply to, and with similar, you know, acceptance rates, whether that's sports medicine or palliative care, what are some sleep medicine, yeah. pain. There are like several ACGME accredited fellowships that there's kind of like equal footing between family medicine and internal medicine residents. There, I think what's exciting in family medicine too is that there are usually more kind of shorter fellowships if you have an even more kind of niche fellowship um, that you want to pursue. So whether that's like a women's health or lgbtq health or there's literally a i don't you would on google like dr google would do a better job than i'm explaining right now but there well, are dr. if you google. go to the i did get dr google this and if you go to the american what is it the american academy of family medicine family physicians website the aafp Dot org, I think, website, and look for their fellowships directory. There are a bunch of options. So, yeah, you can't go into just anything through a fellowship, but there are definitely alternatives. You've mentioned some of them already. Things like addiction medicine, adolescent medicine, emergency medicine, geriatric medicine, hospice and palliative care, integrative medicine, pain medicine, sleep medicine, sports medicine, surgical OB, women's health. Like, there are a bunch and there are some that I did there's also in other categories so you know I think one of the things you brought up the ACGME and I think that's one of the limiting factors the mm -hmm. ACGME is the is the accredi accreditation council for graduate medical education and they are the ones who are basically deciding what residents can and can't go into based on the accreditation process for that residency. Which usually is just amount of weeks on a particular rotation. Like everybody who graduates, for example, from an internal medicine program has to have X amounts of weeks of ICU experience, mm -hmm. of cardiology, you know, and that family medicine may not have the same requirements, which is probably what, what that discrepancy is coming from. But. Yeah. And I think the other thing that you sort of touched on a little bit over is that, and, and something I've noticed over the years is that, there seems to be more than one definition for specialization. Like you can do a fellowship mm -hmm. and be a subspecialist, but you can also decide to say work with different patient populations. Like you mentioned, our LGBTQ clinic here was basically a family medicine doctor who decided that there was a patient population that she wanted to work with. Mm -hmm. And and so she decided to focus on that patient population. And now we have this fantastic program. If you see a need, chances are pretty good that within your scope of practice, which is pretty wide, you can fill that need by educating yourself, by doing a fellowship. You know, you can find a way to serve that, you know, fill that gap. I'm totally basing this off of social media, but I feel like my perception is that people in family medicine have an even wider variety of that ne not necessarily ACGME accredited <clears throat> specialization like I've seen family, family medicine doctors do exclusively like dermatologic procedures whether it's like Botox, laser hair removal, like those type of things, or men's health. You know, there's family medicine doctors who do specifically like AD, BPH type of management. There's concierge, outpatient medicine. And this is not to say that internal medicine doctors could not do that, but as most of their training is in hospitals or inpatient settings i think your experience in family medicine being even more varied gives you maybe even more credibility to pursue some of these various non-ecgme i think like absolutely a big difference in the residencies is that if you just want to do a three-year residency 
and you want a lot of variety, I think family medicine is probably the better choice. You can do OB, you can do pediatrics, you can do adult medicine from a family medicine mm-hmm. standpoint. If you just do three years of internal medicine, you're not as you're probably not as comfortable coming out doing those types of practice. And I think that a lot of people use internal medicine just kind of as a route to get to the fellowship they mm-hmm. want. Other people do it because they really enjoy working in the inpatient setting and being a hospitalist and kind of taking care of patients, you know, at that point in their care. So I think it's important to consider like do you necessarily feel like you want to specialize further and you know if you only want to spend three years training and you want variety i think family medicine is a fantastic mm-hmm. fantastic you option like procedures you have like actual surgical rotations you are like the person who does procedures on the outpatient side, whether that's injections, laceration repairs, in family medicine or residency, I believe you just have more exposure to like surgical type of things as well. Yeah. And you mentioned variety. What I've noticed is that, for instance, I mentioned the LGBTQ clinic. That's not all that this physician, Katie Inberick, is mm-hmm. the person I'm thinking. That's not all she does. I mean, she has other clinic days. Of general primary of general care. general primary she, care. She like helped run well. our like COVID response uh-huh. as like a whole like UHC enterprise. So I would definitely like push back against the premise that family medicine's a dead end. I think there's a, a point of emphasis too, which is the further you get in this medical education, there becomes a point at which more schooling isn't necessarily the means to the end for, say, a goal that you want to achieve. So if you want to work with, you mentioned specifically like pediatric populations or I think you said ob kind of distinctions within family medicine, there, I, I, I don't think it's unfair to say that sometimes like doing fellowships in those spaces isn't is going to be like the right way to get there. I think you get to a point where you actually have a lot of knowledge and a lot of this learning can just come from I am seeing more of this population, more of this kind of niche that I want to grow within. So I'd even argue that not necessarily going into family medicine to pursue a a fellowship is less of a dead end because you actually keep your options much more wide. And we got to remember, like the goal of medicine is to kind of pursue the lifelong learning. Like you're constantly learning. And that's not just through formal medical education, but that's also through learning about patient populations, learning about niches within your field and finding that spot for you. And so I think it's very easy to fall into the the trap that is I must hit every single academic thing to get to where I want to be when you're just starting in medicine. But I think there becomes a point where like academics in the formal sense isn't necessarily the only means to the end yeah. for you. I if wish you, I knew. Oh, sorry. oh, yeah. If you want to, within the academic sphere, if you're concerned about potentially closing doors, there's also a residency called Med, MedPeds, or it combines a combined five-year program of medicine and pediatrics. And from there, you could specialize in ooh, not everything, but like... <laughs> You know, you'd mentioned cardiology, you could specialize in that. You'd mentioned an interest in working with pediatrics, you can specialize in anything. Pediatrics, you can also take those talents and go outpatient with your knowledge as well. So that is, if you're worried about potentially not having those opportunities available to you, there is a combined medicine pediatrics rotation, or residency, sorry. I did notice when I looked at the A the AAFP's website under fellowships, there was an HIV option. There were several HIV mm-hmm. fellowships uh, across the country that... And so if infectious Infectious disease, disease. as you mentioned, as your, I don't know if that was an example or something that you're actually interested in, Emily, you know, there is that, there are those kinds of options that, well, one other thing Dr. Choi pointed out to me is that you can specialize in family medicine and then after the residency is complete, you could go back through the match and do another residency in another field. Of course, there is an opportunity cost there. I don't want to gloss over that. You, you'd you make more as a fellow than you would going back into residency. You'd make more as a family medicine doctor than going back through residency for sure. But aside from that, it's low risk as you already have a career as a family medicine doctor. You know, you, mm-hmm. I wish I knew more about why Emily's mom thinks it's a it's a 
It's a dead end. I feel like I was told this going into medicine, though. Were you? Like, I was told by my father, who I love very much. He told me point blank not to go into medicine. This was as I was going oh, this into is like the, undergrad. This is like a common... This is so common. This so, is what da- parents, doctor parents often tell their kids. Yeah, so my dad is not... He's not a doctor, but he sells orthopedic implants. And so he kind of was in within the medical sphere yeah. and just saw... In some ways, just the downsides to it, as people do when as we talk about you're in medicine, and show. as we already recognize, we're not even really in it. But he told me point blank, don't go into it. I went into undergrad thinking, oh well, let's go get this engineering degree. This seems way better. <laughs> Clearly, that w- did not work out, and here I am today, doing what he didn't think I should do. And I think ultimately he's come around to recognize that it's a really great path for me. He also told me not to do the MD PhD program. So (laughs) (laughs) yeah, I think I had this like personal experience and I don't know what Emily's mom's reasons were for wanting to say that. I think most parents say those things out of wanting to just save their children from hard things in life. And medicine is ultimately like a really hard thing in life to watch a child go through. But that doesn't necessarily I don't think in my case it meant that my dad didn't think I would be a great physician or great in medicine. It just meant that he wanted to shield me from the the upsetting parts that he was noticing. If I had to speculate <laughs> on, Emily's, on Emily's mom, as you proceed through life, generally speaking, your options narrow. The older you get, the more entrenched on a path you are. And so maybe it's just a matter of like Emily's mom's been doing this for a while. Like she, she's she's fully invested in whatever she does in family medicine and, you know, sees that, you know, maybe has forgotten a little bit about the other right. about the other past or those paths have changed over time. And there are also so many non-clinical opportunities with a degree or like a family medicine training like you can go into pharmaceuticals you could go into sales you can go into public policy you can go into administration you can go into like insurance like there's literally Don't say that. you i'm just presenting options <laughs> that like uh, counteract the dead end like yeah profit thing you could go and research i don't know if i like mentioned research telehealth governmental and you know non-profits there's whatever like you want out of medicine like you can use this yeah. degree i think i think things change a lot in training and medical training my father was trained as a general surgeon and when i told him i was going to be a surgeon he had the like this look in his eyes i don't know if you guys have ever seen the meme with like the little golden retriever who is like it's got the like dead to the world eyes and then it's like the vietnam flashback yes. i'm pretty yep. sure yep. i'm pretty sure that's uh, that's what went across his face the same look we, um, we parents cannot avoid being afraid for our children <laughs> no matter what path they, they choose like uh, but I, like talking with him about how his training was like he was drawing his own labs and like doing that kind of stuff yeah. and it's just it's a different it's different now and yeah. training's different and medicine the practice of medicine you know has evolved but i think the training of medicine has gotten a lot different yeah i think the older you get the more you start to realize like maybe my parents aren't the only person that i need to be getting this kind of advice from and i'm not saying your mom is wrong but i'm just saying kind of like zach was just saying parents have a different perception of the world through what they've gone through and like what their children are going uh, through so i so can relate to this don't necessarily way. want emily to feel as though the way that her mom is perceiving the world is the only perception of family medicine Mm -hmm. that is out there. So I don't know if in this case, Emily, if you're really grappling with the fact that you're, you and your mom disagree about this path, but there's really a lot of cool things to do in family medicine. So if you're interested, I would really recommend talking to somebody else within the field at different stages in their career to just ask some of these questions. Well, that's our show, Nathan, Riley, Zach, Rick, thanks for uh, being on the show with me today. Our pleasure. And, thanks, Dave. And what kind of blast. what kind of weak ass centromere would I be if I didn't thank you, Short Coats, for making us a part of your week? If you're new and you like what you heard today, follow the show wherever find. It. Even if you didn't like it, follow the show wherever podcasts are available, like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, YouTube. Thank you to this week's producer, Riley Behan Bush. 
and to this week's editor, Maddie Walleen. The show is made possible by a generous donation by Carver College of Medicine Student Government Ongoing Support from the Writing and Humanities Program. Our opening music is by Dr. Vox, and our closing music is by Catmosphere. I'm Dave Hitler saying don't let the bastards get you down. Talk to you in one week. Hi, short coats. Look, life in medical education, life in America, life in the world is often difficult. And I often wish I could help. All I have is this podcast, but in my wildest dreams, you have the support you need to lead a life of your choosing. You deserve to be happy, healthy, and successful in whatever ways you define those words. So if you need support because you've experienced racism, discrimination, harassment, mental health crises, I want you to be able to get the help that you need. And so I'm going to put some links in the show notes to some resources that you can use. But the bottom line is that for what it's worth, I see you. I know you're out there. I wish I could do more. Maybe I can in ways that I don't understand yet or know about. But I see you and I'm glad you're here and other people are too. This Short Code podcast is a proud member of the MedEd Media Network. Inspiration, information, and guidance on your journey to medical school and beyond at mededmedia.com.